We are on to our second to last assignment of the school year, um, which deals with population samples and inferences. So it's basically going to act as a review of what we've been going over the past few weeks. Um, so you should, by the end of this, feel very comfortable with our measurements and statistics information we've been going over for the past few weeks. Uh, today, you will take a quizzes assignment. Remember, your goal is 80% or higher in three attempts. On this slide, you will see four important vocabulary terms. You will see more as we go through the lesson today. But the four we have here are population inference, valid inference, and representative sample. So remember, a population is the entire group of objects for which data can be collected. What we normally do is we create what's called a representative sample and predict for the entire population. But the population is the entire group you want to study. Now, making a conclusion by interpreting data is called making an inference. And an inference becomes a valid inference when you make an inference that is true um, about a population based on a representative sample. So you can make an inference, but it'd be wrong. You want to make sure your inference is valid based on the information gap. And when you are looking at what information to use, you want to make sure you, you, are, you are using a representative sample usually, or um, in best case scenarios, a random representative sample. Because what that, that's going to do is that's going to accurately reflect the characteristics of an entire population. Now, one of the first things we went over in this brief period with population sampling, inferencing, comparative sampling, um, is the difference between a population and a sample. So remember, the population is the entire group of people, items, or events being studied, and the sample is the smaller reduced group to be surveyed. And then what you essentially do is you create a representative sample um, and use that to predict to the entire population. Now, if you can interview or survey the entire population, that's the best case scenario. But often our population is too large, so we need to create a random representative sample and use that to predict out to the entire population. So on the left here, we have just a, a full example. So we're going to describe the sample in population. We have a Honey Bee Florist customer survey, and they are asking favorite flowers. It looks like 15 are rose, 9 daisy, 16 tulip. Well, the sample is the people who are actually surveyed or asked. This adds to a sum of 40. So the 40 customers surveyed are the sample. Now, the population is all Honey Bee Floors customers. So it's all the customers. So maybe what they did is over the course of, of a week, they um, asked every 10th customer or something like that, what is their favorite um, flower, right? And then they did that. And it happened to be 40 different different survey results or data points. And then they're going to use those 40 data points in order to um, make an inference, which is an educated guess, for the entire population. Now, we're going to look over here um, to the right. And we have a different scenario over here. So Makai wants to find out which shop has the best frozen fruit drink in town. How could Makai conduct a survey with a sample that is representative of the population? Well, what he can do is he can uh, maybe ask one out of every 10 people he meets on the street. Or maybe he can knock on every one out of 10 doors in town or maybe one out of every 100. Maybe he can randomly pick one out of every 100 numbers from a phone book or online. Phone book has basically everyone's number you can contact. But what the key point is here is it wants to be random, and it wants to have an equal chance of different types of people getting picked. He doesn't just want to pick the, his neighbors because that limits the scope of the possible people. He also just doesn't want to pick people who are specifically at one frozen drink spot because then that eliminates, they're probably more of a fan of that drink spot, right? So you want to have that equal opportunity of being picked 
that leads to that random representative sample, which can be used to create um, valid inferences. So this leads us directly into drawing inferences from data. First things first is your survey methodology, meaning it being random, meaning it being representative of the population are crucial. You cannot draw valid inferences from survey results that are not representative because it's going to lead you to an inaccurate inference or prediction. So the first things first is we need to make sure that we have random representative sampling and the survey is, is um, done correctly so that we can draw inferences. Now remember, an inference is a conclusion about a population based on data from a sample or multiple samples. Remember, the more data we gather, the more accurate inference we can make. Now, patterns or trends in data from representative samples can be used to make valid inferences. That is key. Re the representative samples hopefully coming from random randomness, the random representative samples. Estimates can be made about the population based on the sample data. So let's look over here to the left. We have an example here of 400 students at Poly School. She surveyed a random sample of 80 students to find their favorite hobby. So maybe Polly didn't have the time to survey all 400 students, so she scaled that back to a sample of 80. Now we're going to assume this 80, um, it, it's random, which is good. We're also going to assume the randomness led to a representative sample. So 19 said they like to read, 30 said they like to be with friends, 8 said they like to do crafts, and 23 said they like to play sports. We can make a ton of inferences from this data, but one down here is doing crafts is the least popular hobby at, at Poly School, right? It seems like only 8 people do that. Could also make another inference saying the most popular hobby is probably hanging out with friends or maybe even playing sports, right? So there's inferences we can make, but once again... Inferences are likely to be valid and correct with random representative samples, not just any survey method. She, Polly here didn't just interview her friends. That's going to skew the data. She didn't just interview kindergarten students, right? It's a random sample of all students at the school. All right, we got another example over here where Polly surveyed two more samples. So we have basically sample one over to the left, sample two and three. And the question is, do the results from these samples, so samples two and three, support this original inference? And remember, original inference is doing crafts is the least popular hobby. And that seems to be held up here, too, in these, in these other samples, right? Crafts only has 11 here and only 16 here. In both samples, it is the least preferred hobby amongst students. So that uh, increases our confidence level in terms of we can almost definitively, but you can't be definitive unless you interview all 400 students or survey all 400, but we can basically say with a high level of certainty that crafts are probably the least um, popular hobby out of the four here. And the last thing we kind of went over is making comparative inferences about populations. We specifically discussed box plots and dot plots because they are common ways to display data gathered from samples of populations. Um, using these data displays makes it easier to visually compare sets of data and make inferences. Statistical uh, measures such as mean, median, mode, uh, mean, absolute deviation, and interquartile range and range can also be used to draw inferences when comparing data from samples of two populations. So let's look here on the left first. We have a box plot on the top. And the box plot shows how long it takes students in Miss Wang's two math classes to complete their math homework last night. Use the median to make an inference. Well, first of all, a box plot is made up of five different um, points of data. You got the minimum down here to the left. You're going to have the max to the right. The median is the line inside the box. You have Q1, which is the beginning of the box, and Q3, which is the end of the box. So this is asking us to make an inference based on the median. Well, the median in the first period is 30, and the median in the second period is 35. So based on the median, what I can say is students in the second period class tended to take longer to complete the math homework because the middle of the data is a greater number. So I can make that inference based on this box plot uh, display 
um, and using median in order to, to back my inference, which in turn leads to a higher level of truth to that inference. Now, we also discuss dot plots here. And we have Janelle um, connect, uh, collected data for runs scored for two baseball teams in the first eight games of the season. So we're going to have eight data points on the top and bottom. Now, what can Janelle infer from the data? Well, I see the Blue Jays' dots are further to the right on average than the Tigers are. So the Blue Jays seem to be the higher scoring team. What also supports that answer is the mode is greater um, here at 5, and the mode for the Tigers is 2 and 4. So the mode being used as a data point can prove... Uh, or be one way to prove that the inference is correct, that the Blue Jays are the higher scoring team, or seem to be the higher scoring team. What you could also just say is what I mentioned at the beginning, the display of the data, or the spread of the data, is grouped more to the right towards the greater numbers with the Blue Jays and further to the left with the Tigers, which would indicate the Tigers are scoring less runs than the Blue Jays. Now, let's look at this example to the right. We're transitioning back to box plots. So the two data sets show the number of days the team members train before a 5K race. What inference can you draw by comparing the medians? So similar to what we have over here, the median for team B is about, I would say, 24, maybe 23, whereas the median for team A is 20. So what I would say, uh, the runners in team B tended to um, train for more days than team a okay because the median is greater in team b so they're training for a longer number of days what inference can you draw by comparing the interquartile ranges now remember interquartile ranges and i'll type the answer for this one here so we're clear i'll just keep it black i guess <laughs> the median for team b is greater therefore i can infer that team B trained for more days than team A. All right, now down here for part B, um, it's asking about the IQR, the interquartile range. Now remember, the IQR is a measure of spread. It is not a measure of center of data. The higher the IQR, the more spread or the less consistency there exists in data. Well, the interquartile range, you're basically just looking at how big the box is, okay? If you need to specifically calculate it, you subtract the, large, the smaller number on the le left side of the box, and you subtract that away from the right side of the box. So there is more spread, which means less consistency, in number of training days in Team A than Team B because the IQR for team A is greater than the IQR for team B. So what does that mean essentially? That means team A has, in that middle 50% of the data, there's a wider spread. You may have people training for, you know, 13 days, then 20, then 25, then, then 22. There's a higher spread where team B, there is a more clumped up consistency in the middle. Okay, because the IQR is smaller for Team B, the box is smaller, so there's a greater level of consistency within the middle there. Now, that basically wraps up the review. Those are basically the three things we've gone over. Um, kind of cut it into four with box plots and dot plots being um, taught separately. But overall, um, that's what we've covered with data. So you're going to hop into Wednesday's quizzes, which is just a review of what we've covered. Um, and that will be your second to last assignment uh, for the school year.